talk about neuroscience, we can say, you know, this brain region does this. The amygdala is emotion. The hippocampus is memory. And it's not really that simple. It's all these things are working together, kind of like gears working together in a clock or something like that. So now thinking about it too, I mean, if we're able to map out the neural connections in a brain a hundred percent, would it be then possible to read and then store your whole mind, your memories, your personality, everything, and then maybe recreate your brain, like the brain of a dead person or something? Taking a, a car crash victim that's left comatose and putting them in a, a brand new body and Anytime that you're kind of at the cutting edge of a field, um, the laws and the, the ethics haven't really caught up to the, the technological advances, right? It's like that in, in a lot of different things. And when you start to think about people's minds, right, that's something that's very personal to us. So it seems even more important. You don't want people messing around with your mind, right? They, they warned me about that one. Uh, when I went through my stem cell transplant and I had no immune system, they're like, you are not going to be scooping the litter box. And I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually kind of interesting to hear like somebody with that sharp of a memory of, of something that happened so long ago, it, it, it really makes you sit and ponder like, you know, when we struggle real hard to remember something, um, you know, we start to get this idea that memories just fade with time, but then you see something like that happen, and it's like, he went back and accessed a bunch of detail. I just want to get your opinion real quick. Like, what, what do you think consciousness is? Oh, oh yeah, wow. <laughs> Sorry <laughs> to drop that at the last minute. <laughs> Welcome to another Kitchen Sink Microscopy. I'm Eric Rosenblatt. And I'm Casey Rochford. Uh, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe because you're awesome. And that's what awesome people do. And uh, today we'd like to welcome a guest. And uh, he is a former professor of mine from University of Washington in, in Bothell. And uh, his name is Dr. Doug Wacker. Uh, go ahead and say hi, Doug. Hello. Yeah, good to, good to talk to you tonight. Yeah, Doug, Doug is here to talk with us about all the little interesting things that we know about the brain and the vast oceans of things that we don't yet know about the brain. That's and uh, it's it's a lighthearted topic for a change. Uh, we've been doing a whole lot of heavy current event stuff, so we thought it would be good to uh, dig into the the mind. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and it's a topic I'm really, really interested in. Um, you know, we, I would, <clears throat> I probably have quite a few questions. Um, you know, I, in particular, um, I'm, I, I have a cursory knowledge of what a connectome is, but you know, maybe you could okay. provide some your explanation of it and uh, a little bit more about that because I, I think that's a good place to begin. Yeah, sure. So, you know, we, as Casey said, there's a lot that we don't know about the brain. And uh, a big question is why? Why don't we know, you know all these things that we don't know about the brain? What, what is it that is uh, kind of uh, impeding our knowledge of just kind of knowing everything and, you know, this is consciousness and this is how it's created and all these good things? Um, well, one, one reason is that the, I mean, the brain is very complex, a lot of interacting parts, and, and, uh, and, and we don't fully, we can't even fully see all the, the, the interacting parts, at least at once. And one way to think about the brain to, to start to understand it better is to consider what's called the connectome. And all the connectome is, it's just the sum of all of the connections of every neuron or brain cell in, in the nervous system or brain, depending on how you define that. So, you know, neurons or brain cells, these 
cells in the brain that that uh, that communicate with one another. And that's that's how we do things like stand and walk and think and all these things. Um, but they're connected to each other. They're they're they look like trees. You know, they have these kind of this amazing arborization where they're they're making all these. Uh, touching all these other neurons and in each of those places uh, they're potentially communicating with other cells and to try to understand all those connections is is a goal of, of some current neuro research, neuroscience research uh, just to try to understand how the brain works with that yeah that's like a super fascinating topic I'm that's actually something I'm really really interested in um, I <laughs> yeah because it, isn't it kind of like the hope is to someday have it mapped out the way we have the, the genome mapped out or? Yeah, that's right. So the genome is just, you know, all of the base pairs in your genetic makeup, right? And it's, it's those ohms are like the, you know, all of it's basic. So, so all of the genetic, all of the connections, like a giant vast road map of, of each person's brain. And we can talk about this later, but my connectome would look different than, than either of your connectomes. Um, but there would be some commonality. So if you kind of get a, a general road map, then, then maybe we can better understand some things like neurological disorders and so forth that we don't have a, full, a firm understanding of. So. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I know this is kind of an ongoing project. Um, how, and, and I, I've, I've heard that they've mapped out, there have been some completed uh, connectome maps for, for certain organisms, but not humans, I guess. How close are we to having that for, for humans? Oh, that's an interesting question. We're, we're, it's always hard to say how close we are to anything, you know, kind of go off on that tangent a bit. You know, at, at some point in the 1800s, we, you know, I, I think we probably weren't even sure that the brain was made of cells, you know, this well, is this big homogenous structure. So if we think about how far we've gone since then, you kind of think, well, anything's possible. Maybe we're actually much closer to it than we think we are. But, um, but kind of in a more practical sense, um, I think we're, we're pretty far away from at least understanding and reckoning the connectome. Um, we have made strides in seeing it and, and you can see it at different scales, right? So, um, you know, there's this kind of what we gonna call a regional connectome. So your brain is made of all these different regions, just like your body's made of all these different organs and, and all these different parts of the brain um, are associated with different tasks and they, and they all work together. In case you will remember my, my kind of constant uh, analogy with the clock, you know, the brain's a lot like a clock, right? You can't like pull the second hand off and tell time. But in the, I think, especially in the popular press in, you talk about neuroscience, people say, you know, this brain region does this. The amygdala is emotion. The hippocampus is memory. And it's not really that simple. It's all these things are working together, kind of like gears working together in a clock or something like that. Uh, but to get back to your question, um, you know, we've, we've seen the connectome and something called C. elegans, which is a little worm. Um, and it was really hard to piece that together, but now we have some new technology that makes that easier. And I was just looking at a, an article called the Mesoscale connectome of the mouse, which was done by the Allen Brain Institute. Um, so they can see kind of the connectome at a certain level of resolution in a mouse, but that doesn't mean we understand it, right? You can look at a map of, you know, a geographical region and kind of see where all kind of the major highways are, but that doesn't mean you understand the country, right? So, they, so it depends kind of on what you mean by kind of, I guess, reckoning it. We're closer to seeing it than we are to understand it. So. Yeah, that... That's a, I mean, that's a huge project. I, <laughs> yeah, I think I think that one's gonna make the genome project look like uh, I don't know DOS versus whatever we have now. You know. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. It's it's a big undertaking, and uh, and like I said, you know, each there there are questions that can be answered at big at kind of bigger scales and some that kind of need to be looked at at smaller scales and, and everybody's connections between their individual brain cells uh, are different. Like my connectome is different than your connectome. But again, there are commonalities and I think probably um, uh, 
a good goal for maybe the near future, like in the next 50 years, is to be able to kind of know just kind of, we, we know a lot of this already, the, the general kind of activity of between brain regions, for instance, but there's still a lot to know even with that. But if we have that information, then we can start to answer some more interesting questions about brain and behavior, I think so. Hmm. Now, um, earlier you, you had mentioned um, maybe using it as a tool to diagnose, um, uh, you know, brain issues, um, like men cognitive impairments and, and mental impairments and things like that. Do you, sure. do you foresee that being like misused in some kind of, I don't know, like a eugenics kind of way? Or, Ooh. I mean, you, you always have to wonder when, when you get I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, I think there's, with anything in medicine, especially cutting edge medicine, there's the possibility that things can be kind of used in an incorrect way. Of, you know, I suppose that, you know, your connectome is related to your genome. Your genes are kind of part of the picture and the environment being the other picture that kind of constructs what your connectome looks like. Um, and if, uh, you know, there was some disease like schizophrenia or something, which we, we don't have a, a firm understanding of what causes that lots of different things we we define it based on the the behaviors and the kind of the the output of that disease rather than like it's this gene or something right now but if we somehow were able to relate something like schizophrenia to a very specific problem with a connectome then certainly people might be thinking about their kids. Do my kids have these errant connections, you know? And, and can, could you diagnose that, you know, before a baby's born and things? And it becomes kind of one of those things. So, so yeah, I mean, I think that the possibilities for, for kind of manipulating the connectome are there um, in that sense. And anytime you can do that, it can be for good or ill, I suppose, so. I, I guess on the other side of things, you could always make the ethical argument that you know, the brain isn't just carved in stone and you can't just uh, look at the, br the brain in utero and say, this is going to be a problem because it, all, you know, the environment, like you said, everything, oh, yeah. everything goes into shaping uh, what that brain is in any given moment, really. Like yeah, your connectome is, is, is partially, certainly a lot, to a great extent, uh, molded by experience. It's, it's kind of, there are these general patterns that are there and, and some of those are related to kind of, you know, all humans have these certain patterns and then there's some kind of genetic peculiarities between people and then experience shapes that even more. And, you know, thinking about modifying the connectome, it reminds me of uh, kind of a, the whole genetically modified food, you know, debate thing, right? That yeah. people, like, <laughs> depends on the technique that you use to modify it. Like if you're in a laboratory modifying the connectome, it seems more nefarious than like, if you're teaching someone something, that's also modifying the connectome. Just like with genetically <laughs> modified food, we've been modifying corn for, you know, 10,000 years or whatever. But, you know, it's, it, as soon as we do it in the laboratory, suddenly it becomes more problematic. So, so you're right. I mean, our day-to-day -day experiences are shaping changes in our connectome as well, and, and we're less worried about that, I suppose. So yeah, we're we're essentially modifying our own connectome every day, all day, right? My connectome is organic. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> You've been waiting to say that one. <laughs> 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. I think it, it, it's mapping this out, you know, it's, it sounds to me a lot like reverse engineering an electronic circuit or a computer program or something. And I think it's a good thing uh, because the potential for understanding mental disorders or how things work in the brain. I mean, we may discover what consciousness actually is. And, and so I think that's a, a very laudable goal there. Um, certainly worth it. But, but yeah, I, I, I do worry a little bit about the potential for abuse. I mean, I think anything like that could, could go in that direction. Yeah. I definitely sub subscribe to the idea that more knowledge is good. Um, yeah. You shouldn't hide things, but uh, you know, it's anytime that you're kind of at the cutting edge of a field, um, the laws and the, the ethics haven't really caught up to the, the technological advances, right? It's like that in, in a lot of different things. And when you start to, 
think about people's minds, right? That's something that's very personal to us. So it seems even more important. You don't want people messing around with your mind, right? So um, yeah. I could see how, yeah, it's, it's going to be an interesting, you know, next 50 years or so as we kind of make more advances in neuroscience to be able to kind of reckon these things ethically and for sure. So. Yeah, so now thinking about it too, I mean, if we're able to map out the neural connections in a brain 100%, would it be then possible to read and then store your whole mind, your memories, your personality, everything, and then maybe recreate your brain, like the brain of a dead person or something, you know, say it's intact. Could you do that? What do you think about that? Uh, huh. um, well, you know, you, you bring first, I should, I should mention you're bringing up um, some topics that are in a book that uh, that I use when I, I teach a class on brain and behavior at, at University of Washington in Mapo called uh, Brain and Behavior. And one of the books that we read is called Connecto. It's by uh, a researcher named Sebastian Sung. And, and he, he does a great job in that book of you know, talking about the history of neuroscience and scientific thought really as it relates to the connectome and, and neuroplasticity or how you know, the brain changes with experience. But then he gets into these kind of what are now are currently science fiction kind of topics, you know, like uploading your brain and things like that. And, <laughs> and I, I think there, there, there are steps in that process, right? The first step is being able to see the connectome. And these, these are steps straight from his book. And I, I've taught it for so long. It's kind of, you know, uh, in terms of steps is, you know, you, first you need to see the connectome. And then once you see it, you know, that doesn't mean you understand your book and it doesn't mean you understand what's on the page, right? So once we see it, then we have to kind of understand it. And, and you know, we're, our computers are getting faster, storage is greater, and, and computationally that might become more and more possible as time goes on. Um, but that's the big step is understanding it. And then, you know, in order to do something crazy like upload someone's consciousness, that have to understand and, and you know in my mind as soon as we read the connective we'll understand consciousness right everything in the brain is is not just the connections between neurons it's arguably a very big part but there's also the, the cells themselves and their constituents and and other surrounding tissues and there's all kinds of things hormones that are interacting to kind of create the cells so um i think it, I never say never, but we're way, way, way far away from being kind of able to make, you know, these conscious golems of ourselves, you know, or something and live forever. You know? <laughs> it's really cool stuff to think about, but it, we're, we're a ways away from that. Yeah, that, uh, that's a good. I mean, that would be a, a cool bit of technology. Like the, the implications from that could be anything from like uh, taking a, uh, a car crash victim that's left comatose and putting them in a, a brand new body and, and, and restoring their conscious consciousness. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's cool to like daydream about what, what we could do with this and, and why it's a good idea to keep going down that path. And how much of it would need to be kind of ported over for it to be that person, right? Like, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. if it, reasonable amount of stuff like it's kind to you is that good enough you know <laughs> oh it's, Ooh, it's, that's, it's, that's a lot of interesting questions mm. it's kind of creepy too like you know uh if the, the idea that it almost we could almost replicate a person but not quite you yeah. come back ever so slightly different and there's no uh, error right even if we we're really good at it there'd be yeah something there, so. <laughs> exactly that's a subject that's probably good uh science fiction novel fodder right there yeah there's a book uh oh i think the author's name was david brin but i i could be wrong on on that um and it was called the kiln people and uh it was a book about people uploading their consciousnesses into these golems basically but there were different like models like there was this this golem that you could upload yourself into if you needed to do yard work which it didn't need to philosophize and think about you know the mysteries of the universe it didn't need those parts of you it just needed to like get the yard mode you know 
Mm -hmm. And then there were other ones that were kind of more suited for my more advanced tasks. Um, and it was an interesting story because the, the, uh, the, these golems couldn't last very long. They kind of deteriorated quickly. But then the logical advance where they started lasting longer, and then you had to start wondering about like the rights of these creatures and like were the ones that were more advanced and more technologically capable also have more rights than the ones that were just doing the yard work and stuff. And it was really kind of a fascinating book. And it is science fiction, but, you know, it's just like, the old, you know, Arthur C. Clarke stuff, you know, decades ago, you know, this stuff is the way people think about these things ethically before they really happen, you know, so another 50, 60 years from now, maybe that book is probably not real, but maybe we're kind of addressing some of those questions, you know, you never know. So. Well, yeah, a lot of science fiction eventually becomes fact, you know, it becomes reality. It molds reality sometimes too. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah Star, totally Star Trek's a great example of that. Like, I mean, the cell phone's basically a communicator. <laughs> In fact, the guy who developed the, the cell phone used that as a template. Like, that's what his goal was, was to build a Star Trek communicator. So it's kind of cool. Yeah. Actually, now they're kind of more like tricorders even. <laughs> yeah, it's a good point. So, so I wonder, you know, with, let's say we could map out uh, the human brain in this way, you know, in some kind of, general sense do you, do you think at some point we get to the point where we know enough about the human brain the structure of it that we could control someone's mind you know as in inducing a specific behavior or something you, you think that's possible yeah i mean I, I certainly think it's possible whether we're close to it or not it's a different question i mean we, we already see this happen right i mean and we don't understand how it happens but you know, a great example, and I guess not in, in humans, but in animals, is, is rabies, right? Rabies um, will affect an animal, and it changes what seem to be fairly complex manifestations of its behavior. You know, it either becomes really angry and vicious or super friendly and fearless. And if you think about that, like, as a you know, anthropomorphize a moment, think about it as a person, you know, being fearless that's like a big part of somebody's personality, right? So this, this mindless virus is already going into the brain of the animals and changing what we think is fairly complex behavior. So, you know, that suggests that maybe some of these mechanisms, it doesn't, it doesn't mean this, but it suggests that maybe some of these mechanisms that we think are really complex are maybe not quite as complex as we, as we think they are, right? And maybe if that's the case, maybe there are little manipulations that could could really result in a wholesale change in our behavior so um so it's not out of the realm of possibility certainly wow but yeah because I, I was reading about like zombie ants and stuff and it, it's super fascinating this fungal infection manipulates them to do very very specific things that basically uh perpetuate this fungus uh, by by controlling the the ant to do its bidding, and yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, like, how, how is that like even climbs to the end of the of this blade of grass and basically just sits there until it's it and basically advertises itself. Uh, it not, I guess that's not really the case. I guess the sheep come along and they eat the they eat the uh, grass. They're not looking for the ant, but still, it's it's just basically putting itself out there to be eaten alive, basically, uh, mm -hmm. to do the bidding of the parasite. So it, it's changing behavior that is evolutionarily meaningful, right? It's it's associated with survival and yeah, yeah, that's super interesting. I Man, it, it actually does kind of sound like uh, the stuff of some kind of sci-fi horror, um, you know, because if it's possible there, like you're saying, maybe, maybe things aren't as complex as we think they are from in a behavioral sense. So could it be done to humans? Yeah. And uh, there's, there's another great example that we talk about in this brain behavior class that Casey probably remembers is uh, to Toxoplasma gondii, which is this parasite that uh I, I saw your cat earlier the cats get they're the definitive host for this parasite um and it it they shed it in their their feces and then rats pick it up and they probably can pick it up via lateral transmission and stuff as well but 
these rats then um, will start to seek out, the infected rats will start to seek out the smell of cat urine, right? Huh. And so there's a vertebrate. Now, the weird thing about, I mean, that's amazing. And, and it, when this research came out, it was really it captivated a lot of people. But there's a, a researcher in the Czech Republic, and I don't know how to pronounce his name, but I think it's Fleger. It's, it's like F-L-E-G-R. Um, and he's looked at people that have been infected with Toxoplasma gondii as well. And these are sub, well, what we think are sub clinical um, uh, cases, right? So, so people that have this disease and it's like, or have this parasite, it's full blown, like a, a compromised immune system can get really sick and they can die. And there's all kinds of terrible things that can happen. But when healthy people have it, it just kind of is in stasis and doesn't really do anything. But this researcher has done some work that suggests that it probably has subtle effects on people's moods and personalities. So, so this kind of manipulation by parasites, different than manipulation by other humans, kind of like you know altering something in the laboratory or whatever. But still, this 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 alteration may already be happening in people. So, and and both of us as cat owners, we don't know. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, I I remember that particular. Um... Uh, T. gondii, they, they warned me about that one uh, when I went through my stem cell transplant and I had no immune system. They're like, you are not going to be scooping the litter box. And I was like, yes. <laughs> uh, right. Is your immunocompromised and it could cause real problems, and, but, but it could be causing subtle problems and all that. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that yeah, maybe it turned me into a real asshole. I don't know. Yeah. No, you're <laughs> a nice guy. That, that concept is, is like, simultaneously fascinating and horrifying um you know it it, it, it kind of scares me a little bit and i'm a little worried about my cat uh, but yeah that's an interesting thing I, I must say just real quick i must say that the the you're more likely to get infected with uh toxoplasma gondii by eating uh undercooked meat than you are by cat your cat is if your cat's indoor it can't have it and I think it's it, you're only the cat can only have it over a very short period of its lifetime or something like that. I'm not expert in that. So so actually, you, if you like rare meat, you, know, you eat your steak on the rare side. You're much more likely to contract it via that than all your right. Cat. So don't go throwing your cat outside. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Floyd, you're off the hook now, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I oh man, yeah. That, so I I I wonder, you know, I kind of got into the got a little bit curious about all of these um brain oddities i guess when my grandpa uh came down with alzheimer's i came down contracted i don't know i'm not you know i'm not entirely sure what it really is but he had alzheimer's and there were all these strange things that happened you know he, he went into the closet and started fighting with the coats in the closet and thought it was somebody coming into his house to attack him. He thought that his wife uh, was some cleaning lady that lived upstairs in a single story house. But yet at the same time, I, I remember sitting down and talking to him and he was telling me stories about when he was a little kid and all the crazy things they did. And he got like super sharp detail and you know, so that really got me interested in that. Um, and so what, what do you know about maybe, maybe that particular topic or other yeah. unusual or bizarre brain things that, that, that happen? I've sure. Yeah. So, I mean, so I'm, so I'm, I'm certainly not an expert in Alzheimer's disease, um, but it, that is a disease where it's associated with a, uh, with particular kind of physical manifestation, these plaques and tangles in the in the brain, but that comes later. It, it there's it, it, people have Alzheimer's disease before those things happen, and what causes it, and why certain people are more likely to to develop Alzheimer's disease than other people. There seems to be some kind of genetic basis to that. is is not well understood, and it's one of those diseases that we might uh, um, be able to learn a little bit more about by kind of understanding the connectome a little bit better. Um, I mean, it's not for certain that that's the case, but very well maybe. Um, but yeah, how those diseases just in general affect 
the brain is, is fascinating to me as well. I mean, so again, your brain is compartmentalized, but also works like pieces of an interacting puzzle, right? So, you know, it may be that the, the places that you have stored, now I'm like, waving, waving my arm. So I got uh, going, going off script here, but, uh, yeah, um, it, you know, yeah, yeah. So that means don't trust anything I'm about to say. No, um, but it, you know, where your very long-term memories are stored, like I think about your grandfather stuff, he, you know, was able to, to kind of remember with sharp detail. And then the parts of the brain associated with how he's kind of currently interacting with the world and how he's kind of reckoning, his thoughts versus his perceptions and current sensations and all these things um, are probably all connected, but they're a little bit different. So it's, you know, you, you can imagine like someone had a brain injury. If they injure a particular part of the brain, there may be certain things that are affected and other things that aren't. And diseases work in, in similar ways that diseases may attack certain areas of the brain more than others and lead to kind of certain uh, types of behaviors and, you know, an Alzheimer's disease that, memory problems, um, eventually, and certainly confusion and things are, are common. Um, but, you know, it also gets at the self a little bit and identity and, and, and it's hard to, I guess, understand how it's working because we really don't understand how the brain comes together to, to make us, right? And that's, uh, to kind of weave back to the connectome thing, that's, that's one of the goals of, of that line of research is try to understand how all these brain pieces work together to make us who we are. Yeah, I mean, that, that really interests me because um, when I saw my grandpa go through that, you know, he, he was a fairly capable, strong individual and then rapidly declined into, I, I mean, I, the only way I could describe it was, was he went insane. He lost all sense of self and cohesion, just connection with the world around him and stuff. And it, that's one of the, my greatest fears actually, apart from high voltage. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, so I, I think this is a, a really important project to, uh, you know, to work on. Like th this is a big deal. Um, yeah, uh, my grandpa had Alzheimer's too, and, and what I remember was he would be, you know, fairly lucid and talking to us, and then all of a sudden, like, who knows what triggered this, he thought he was driving a bus, like, back when he was in his 20s or something, and he was, you know, s describing the cars going by, they were all, like, 40s models or whatever, and, uh, you know, a lot of people were like, no, 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 you, you're you're in the rest home and, and I'm like, hey, just, you know, let him tell a story, you know, cause uh, it's actually kind of interesting to hear like somebody with that sharp of a memory of, of something that happened so long ago, it, it, it really makes you sit and ponder. Like, you know, when we struggle real hard to remember something, um, you know, we start to get this idea that memories just fade with time, but then you see something like that happen and it's like, he went back and accessed a bunch of detail. Like that's still written down somewhere. In oh there. yeah. Oh, so that's, and, that's really yeah, weird. That, that's you know? fascinating to me as well. Yeah. And it's like some things you wonder if those things are just kind of locked away in there somewhere and, and it's an, it's an access problem. Right. And if something, there's a trigger or something that maybe you can, even if it's an artificial trigger, maybe you can access some of those old memories. I, you know, uh, I find that I'm, I'm in my mid, mid push in late forties now. And, and it's funny what I remember, like I can remember things from my childhood really clearly, but sometimes I can't remember, you know, a student's name that was in my class or something, you know, like a couple of years ago or something like that. And it, and it, it is fascinating to me. And, and suppose that, that information comes back, you know, where did it go, right? Um, but with Alzheimer's disease, it's, it's that, it, especially the story you said, which I think there's a lot to be learned from kind of listening to these, these stories of people that this idea, you know, someone can kind of be totally acting normally, maybe you to all appearances thinking normally and kind of click into the state and then kind of click out of it. Um, 
so there's a temporal aspect to all this as well, which is, is would be really interesting to, to understand better because, you know, if people can kind of click out of it, how long can they click out of it, you know, and what, what allows them to do that? And, and, you know, if there is damage or something to particular brain areas, that's kind of causing that kind of hopping into these, these, these unfortunate states, then, you know, if, it, if you pop out of it, is that, does that mean it's reversible in some way? I mean, it just seems to be a lot to be learned by, by thinking of it that way. Yeah. I kind of wonder if it's just like, we have these kind of noise filters that get built up by the connectome. That's like, um, you know, like you don't really need to remember this so clearly. Oh, it's yeah. not that important. And so I'm just going to kind of filter it so it doesn't get in the way of, of more important things like, and, and maybe with Alzheimer's or, or other forms of dementia, maybe those filters just start to fade away or slip out of place temporarily. And, and uh, maybe maybe that's what's triggering these like s these strange recalls where they actually think they're back in time and uh, yeah. like it's just so right. real. Which you know, what you reminded me of Casey is uh, that uh, another book that we read in this brain and behavior class, as you know, is uh, the man who mistook his wife for a hat, which is uh, was by an author Oliver Sacks who passed away. Uh, a few years ago and uh, they're basically neurological case studies and books are great that he writes because it really each chapter is very short case study about some kind of unusual case in neurology and, and brain and behavior and um, I don't know if you remember this particular chapter but there were a couple of, of women who had uh, some brain issues and one woman I believe had some kind of aberrant electrical activity in her temporal lobe and basically it, it, an older woman and it transported her back to her childhood in Ireland. She heard these songs. She, it started out with her hearing these songs from her childhood. And she, uh, she thought there was a radio on and all these things and then realized that, you know, it was in, coming from her brain. Um, but these were songs that she, before this, could not, and she was, she was, it was evoking scenes from her childhood that she, could not remember prior to these, I don't know if they're like in a mini epileptic events or what they were um, happening. So it was like, and, and it actually brought her joy because it, it, she remembered her mother um, who she'd lost when she was really young and pretty much had lost all memory of. Um, oh, so wow. those memories were kind of trapped in there. And then via these, this kind of song hallucination thing, uh, she even said, you know, to, to Oliver Sacks, it felt like she was transported back to her childhood and could, you know, be there with her mother and things. So, wow, these cases, you can't study them really because they're not real common, but just, you know, the fact that that even occurred and this woman was, you know, legitimately experiencing, the, experiencing these feelings is, is amazing. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Because, you know, I think about this a lot, like what, what is memory? And how much can we actually store? How much information can we store? Because I, I think about things and there are moments in the past that I recall with absolute clarity, like I could reconstruct it perfectly. And then there's things that are kind of foggy and vague and stuff. Um, but I just wonder how, how does that get stored? Well, the, the music thing, I, I, I seem to remember this sparked a really great conversation in class in which I, I, get, I just got to say, as an aside, that was hands down the coolest class I have ever taken in my life. So everybody out there, you should enroll in UW Bothell and uh, take this class. <laughs> nice. It's but, easy to um, teach a class on the topic that's that interesting. So, yeah. Yeah. But, but it, it's, it's interesting with that the music would um trigger these intense memories it's almost like we we have these bookmarks or something that, mm. that get stuffed into a memory and then when when some kind of like trigger associates with that bookmark it, it opens up to that page or something you know like if i've i've smelled things that reminded me of a person i hadn't thought about in years you know yeah it's, i've had the, the same same experiences and, and also with music where I'll hear a song and I, I can, I'm like transported to the time where that song is most strongly connected. And, and you know, I can, 
see things and smell things and I feel the same feelings that I felt then. It's really powerful. Yeah. And you know, memories are back. So as far as how memory is stored, you know, it's still, there's been a lot of research on learning and memory and then we know a lot about how memories are stored, but we don't know everything and memory is not probably stored in one particular way. You know, there's changes in the strength of connections between neurons, things like long-term potentiation and um, and then there, you know, there are actual changes in the neural neural cell bodies themselves. You know, so there, there are a variety of ways that things potentially could be remembered, depending on what is being remembered. Um, but memory is associated with all these senses, right? So there's, and it, it's funny what, what triggers these memories too. And and in connectome, you know, Sebastian Sun kind of comes up with a hypothesis to explain memories based on the connection of brain cells or neurons. And he, he calls these uh, cell assemblies. And, and the idea is uh, that there are neurons in the brain that represents very specific things. Um, I've heard them called grandmother neurons before. Like there's a neuron in your brain that when it fires, you, you know, you think of your grandmother, right? Hmm. And, and there's some experimental evidence to this as well. So they, they've isolated, <laughs> In the book, they talk about the Jennifer Aniston neuron. They found a neuron <laughs> in someone's brain that fired when they thought of Jennifer Aniston, and and um, but not other you know actresses and actors. Um, but Sebastian Sung, and hey, we can talk about that certainly. But Sebastian Sung thought, well, then maybe there's you know a neuron that is an actress neuron that connects to that Jennifer Aniston neuron, and then there's the David Schwimmer neuron. So he was another. <laughs> You know, and it's connected to the, the Jennifer Aniston neuron. And, you know, there's the troll two, you know, this is in troll two or leprechaun, you know, neuron. <laughs> Sorry, it's my B horror movie it's coming up. And that's connected to Jennifer Aniston. And, you know, and, and any one of those things, like you see David Schwimmer in a you know, new movie or something, he's still doing movies or whatever. And, and you think of friends and then you think of Jennifer Aniston and, and that we have triggered because they're actual individual cells that are connected to one another that when they're activated, they then activate the neurons they're connected to, and that causes this kind of, this chain of memories. And that's still hypothetical, because um, we haven't been able to identify the Jennifer Aniston neuron, and simultaneously the Friends neuron and the David Schwimmer neuron to kind of prove this. But just the fact that there is a, you know, a Jennifer Aniston neuron in this person's brain suggests that this might be the case. And, and, and that might be one way that memories are stored, but there's certainly, evidence of other mechanisms of memory storage as well. So. I think there's evidence that this author is just a shill for the, uh, the friends uh, conglomerate. <laughs> <laughs> you must have been paid on the side now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that, that brings up an interesting thing. Um, you know, I, I've, I'm really uh, interested in the way the mind works and everything. And, you know, I, I, I'm not going to say I've had any experiences because I don't want to get into trouble, but you know, the, the DMT and LSD experiences that people have and the otherworldly, you know, geometric patterns and sense of feeling connected, like there's aliens and all this stuff that, um, what do you think about that? Like what could cause that? Yeah. So, you know, I mean, these are chemicals that act on existing receptor systems in the brain. So, so your, your neurons secrete chemicals. Um, neurotransmitters is a functional category of these secretions uh, that are released into what's called a synaptic cleft. And, and, and for, in order for them to communicate to the next cell, they have to bind a receptor kind of like a, a key going into a lock, right? And these... Drugs like DMT, for instance, um, if memory serves, I think they may alter a serotonin receptor, but I can't, I can't remember for certain uh, neurotransmitters, although they do it in a slightly different way, potentially. And you think these neurotransmitters are normally kind of involved in things like thought and perception, and suddenly you stick like this artificial drug in there that's binding those same receptors at the wrong time in the wrong context with all the other pieces working at the same time, you know, and suddenly think, you know, there's a deity in the room with you or something. Right. And, and so it, just to think that we kind of have these feelings, you know, people like DMT is a great example, I think, because people 
that take that drug often say they experience an, an entity in the room with them. Or something. Yep. Um, <laughs> people will have those feelings in normal life. Like you have this weird feeling, you know, you're watching Stranger Things or something and you're like, oh, is there somebody behind me or something? And that seems like a context appropriate time to feel that way or, or someone is having some kind of religious experience or something. Um, those things all happen under natural circumstances. It, it doesn't surprise mm -hmm. me that a drug that maybe would bind receptor systems that are associated with those feelings could induce that at the wrong time and cause disorientation and confusion, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, that's yeah. You know, religious experiences reminds me. Um, I think we were gonna do do a whole episode on this, but I I, would, I just wanted to ask you real quick: Have you heard of, or do you know anything about the God Spot? Yeah, so I a little bit. So I don't really think there is. I, so, uh, oh, what's it's, it's a misnomer. There's not like one little spot or whatever, but the, the, yes, Ram. Yeah, that, that's it. That's it. Yeah, and, and, uh, neurologist, neurology researcher, um, and I, he even says in a video that I've seen that they had misattributed that that God spot term to him. But um, but the idea is that there might be an area, and then that's probably not true. But areas of the brain that are associated with religious experience, and and of course. Um, then you get suddenly into semantic argument because you know what is a religious experience a religious experience for a buddhist is going to be different than for a christian than different for someone you know adhering to some folk religion or something somewhere and and the experiences of people even within a religion are going to be different you know what is that religious experience so i think without kind of a definition of what is a religious experience it's going to be difficult to narrow that down to one area but but there do seem to be brain regions that are associated with religious feelings and the temporal lobe is one of those and and the evidence we have for that is when people have uh, epileptic seizures that originate in the temporal lobe sometimes they have religion religious delusions or uh, have religious experiences so so it's you know uh, and then I've seen religious people uh, have then interpreted that as okay that's the part of the brain by which you know a deity maybe communicates to people you know, and, and that's a fair, you know, interpretation. Whereas, you know, maybe the more materialist folks are like, okay, that's the part of the brain that makes people feel religion. Now, you know, whatever you subscribe to there is fine, but but there certainly seem to be brain regions, regions with a, with a big S that seem to be associated with those types of feelings, but it depends on how you define them. Oh man, that is super interesting. And then this kind of segues into uh, another, I guess, kind of related thing, near-death experiences. Right. Because, I, you know, I, I, I've done a little bit of research into that, but they seem to, there seem to be some commonalities between them. And So I don't know much about them, and, uh, but I know a couple of things, and, and, and they're not real scientific. So... Yeah. One thing is, you know, that how we define death is a is a surprisingly evolving thing, I guess. You know, it, 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 what is brain death? You know, and now that we know that the brain pieces work together to, to kind of yield different states, what part of the brain has to be dead and for how long before the person's dead? Hmm. Right. And, and traditional definitions of death, like your heart stops beating for the certain amount of time or whatever, you know, I, I, I maybe are you're outdated. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But I do know that people that have these near death experiences feel very, very emotionally charged about them. So I think it's a really tricky topic to talk about because, you know, I can't even imagine what it would be like to wake up and have someone say that you were dead and you're like, but I was experiencing stuff and yeah. how to reconcile that. And I, I think it's a, it's a real, I, I know someone that had a, a near death experience and it was quite a charged topic with them because you're not going to be able to have kind of a logical conversation with people. They're going to be like, Nope, I was dead. I felt this. And you know, this is what I think, you know, and you can't argue with that. Right. Yeah. So, no, it, 
And, and I think the, the Connectome project is probably a way to understand that. I mean, imagine imaging the brain of somebody who's dying or dead or yeah. throughout the process. Let's say we had some technology could do it live. Well, we have functional MRI. So theoretically, yeah. if, if you pulled the plug on someone and had a, an fMRI going, I suppose you could see firings as they kind of fade away, right? Yeah, I don't know if anybody's ever done that. I mean, it certainly seems ethically questionable in humans. Uh, yeah, I, I, I hereby submit <laughs> yeah. to it. I'm going to put it in my will. Um, you can look yeah. at my brain when I die. And there <laughs> you I go. I mean, maybe, maybe that's already happened. Because I could see if someone gave kind of informed consent to say, you know, like I, when I am dying, and there'd be all kind of questions about the mode of someone's death. I'm sure if there was an accident or something, it would, wouldn't be like that. And, and when would you put them in there? Because that, you know, that, but, uh, but I don't know if there have been any animal studies looking at that and, and, and certainly don't know of any human studies, but that doesn't mean they, they haven't happened. And that would be interesting to look at. I, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Just understanding stuff like that, like what's happening at, at those very final moments or or leading up to those moments even where you're you're in question um will probably um draw out some arguments even longer like the uh, terry shivo yeah if i remember her name correctly that's yep, some right. years ago um you know that was a huge deal and and uh, that was all conjecture but someday we might be able to say look we have the connectome of consciousness. She's conscious in a, in a sense, and, you know. And I, suspect, yeah. and I suspect that there have been situations where people that were kind of in long-term comas have been put into fMRI machines because, you know, families are probably trying to grasp at, at kind of solutions to that. And then whether those people ever came out of the coma would be an interesting thing. But that, that's the thing about the near-death experience that would be tough, right, is because it's the near death experience. It's the, it's the combination of the data that you would get from the functional MRI, which basically just for folks that don't know, it just will show activity levels of certain brain areas, right? In a very kind of gross sense, like this part of the brain is active, um, not this neuron or specific cell, but this part of the brain. But you would have to couple that with then asking the people what they felt during that process. And that would suggest that you thought they were going to die when they went into the machine. But then they didn't, so you pulled them out. And, and yeah, I mean, that's not something that you'll be able to simulate, but uh, huh. ethically at least, yeah, so. Hmm. That's interesting, yeah. I, I, I think we could do a whole episode on near death, probably. Yeah. But that's, that's really fascinating stuff. Um, yeah. yeah, wow. I, I, I think we've, <laughs> we've pretty much covered, covered a lot. Um, I, I just, I, I just want to get your opinion real quick. Like what, what do you think consciousness is? Oh, oh um, yeah. Wow. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I dropped that at the last minute. <laughs> yeah. Not, not like oh, a yeah by the way, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I have thought about this a lot. Um, and, but I guess, I, wow. I mean, I've thought more about what consciousness isn't then I think I've thought about what consciousness is. I mean, I, I mean, I don't study. So first of all, I don't study the connectome. I'm trained neuroscientists. Um, I study behavior and I, I do study neural connectivity as it relates to, to kind of to brain and behavior, but not just the totality of all connections and how they, they relate to behavior. So I'm not a part of that kind of mapping process. And I don't study consciousness, but I, I definitely study you kind know, of complex social behavior in animals. Um, yeah, I mean, as far as what it is, I, I've always, as someone that's not like a consciousness researcher, I suppose, I, I think it has something to do with self-awareness and the ability to be able to kind of know that you're thinking about things, kind of that seems like a real shaky kind of definition, right? And, you know, I, I don't think we can say that, you know, humans only have this ability. Um, yeah. what I, what I don't think it is, is, you know, I think there's, it's in vogue now to kind of, uh, for folks that, that aren't, you know, trained in, in science to, to kind of grasp on to whatever the latest 
not well understood topic is and then attribute consciousness to it. Like, like I don't know if consciousness has anything to do with quantum mechanics. It, you know, it, it might, but yeah. just because we can't study it doesn't mean that those things are necessarily related, right? And I think there's kind of this, this movement, which uh, now I'm going to be on like shaky ground, but I kind of like, I think it's analogous to kind of like the intelligent design movement, kind of like this, this movement to kind of explain things that are currently inexplainable without empirical testing, you know? And so, so I, I think part of the, the wonder of consciousness is that we don't understand it. Um, that's and a good it, point. Yeah. yeah. So, well, I don't know if that's a good answer, but yeah. I, no, I, I, yeah. I, yeah, it's probably too big of a thing to really. I mean, I, I read a book. I can't recall who wrote it um, right now, but there was like a whole chapter that uh, broke my brain. It, it, it <laughs> was like, <laughs> it, it, it was like, what exactly is me or I, you yeah. know, like what, what is that concept? Because your interpretation of who you are oh, yeah. is completely different from how other people interpret you and, and it's all based on interactions. So like, do you exist? Like, it, it was like, what? <laughs> oh man, we're getting totally metaphysical here. <laughs> oh, people have talked about consciousness that in, in that way too. Like just the way that you perceive the world, like our things are probably subtly different, but there's no way for us to really know that. And those kind of, subtle differences in the way that we perceive things like like what does i wore this red shirt what does red look like to you and you yep. and i've they, wondered they, that a lot actually too. Yeah. yeah they look I, I, it, it's unlikely that uh, that what i think is red is green to you that's unlikely right based on kind of some general wiring patterns and the kind of cones we have in our eyes and all that stuff but it, it might look a little different, right? Like the whole thing with the, you know, like the, the dress, you know, depend, you know, it's a blue dress or a brown dress or whatever, you know, yeah. and all those things. It's like the, the, that, those slight subtle differences in perception seem to define us, right? And, and people have looked at those things that are interested in consciousness. Yeah, and that would yeah. explain probably why people have different tastes in... Yeah all sorts of things like you know why would somebody buy a lime green painted car i don't know but apparently to them it looks awesome so yeah, there's maybe, there's definitely a, a perception thing that's just uh, a big part of that because it's like you you can point to certain physical things like oh well that particular color is 240 nanometers or whatever you know it's it's got like something that you can yes. measure yeah. and say that's exactly what it is but you have no way of knowing what it looks like to other people, you know? And, and that's, that's really hard to wrap your head around. And, and so like if you downloaded your brain and put it into another body, is it going to perceive color different? Is that oh. going to screw with your head? <laughs> Man. Yeah. And those are things maybe you don't even think about. Like, like the, your, you know, subtly different interpretation of your perception. Perception is just basically the way we reckon the world, right? You sense that they, you know, color different wavelength you get sensing color but you're sensing different wavelengths of light through your retina and they go to your brain and your brain basically makes up color out of those wavelengths of light um in a chemical interpretation of those but this like the fact that i see red a little bit differently i mean we don't even know if that's true so you know how in the heck are you going to model that for that uploaded thing right and maybe it would you walk in and be like that's not red what what happened you know and I mean, yeah, yeah and it probably, I would imagine it would work the same way with sound too. It, it might yeah. explain why some people think that Smash Mouth is an awesome band and Boston <laughs> isn't the best band in the entire universe. You know, so eh, just it's, <laughs> it's just cultural too, but, 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 but you're right. You know, it's like, I wonder like why people like, like, why do I not like banana flavoring? You know, it's like, I just don't like it. And, and, and I don't think I was ever forced to eat it, you know, and that, you know, I'm not crazy about the consistency. I think I understand that, but that flavor, it could be in like a pudding, you know, and, and with lots of sugar and I still don't like it. And why is it that particular flavor doesn't appeal to me, but my, my, my kids really like bananas, you know, I, it doesn't make sense to me, you know? So, and that, 
that's qualitative. I don't think that's cultural. I mean, you know, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is, uh, oh man, this has been an excellent conversation. This is great. We no, need to come we'll back forever. <laughs> yeah. We, we need to come back to this again. I'm sure we will. Um, yeah, you see why this was my favorite class is because like there's so many tangents you can run off on. And, oh yeah, oh, totally. Uh, you're a great student, and I appreciate your your thoughts about the class. Like I said, these things are so interesting to people. I mean, it's part of the reason I got into neuroscience as a field is that it was just so amazing to to think about how the brain works. You know, I mean, who's not going to be interested in that, right? And and oh yeah. No. So, so it's a, it's a, it's an easy class to teach, but, uh, but it, yeah, it really opens up a lot. And, and, and I hope that in the class and, and it sounds like it's like this with you, but you probably walked in with these kind of ideas as well is that it kind of opens people's minds to think about these things in different ways, really, you know, like if they see, um, a, a grandparent that has Alzheimer's disease, you know, you need you're going to empathize with that person and, 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 but then, you know, you're, you're wondering what's happening. And sometimes understanding can give you some comfort as well, you know. And um, so, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a wonderful topic to think about for sure. So, yeah, I mean, the, the guy that sat next to me was a business major. Yeah. Because that was the other great thing about the class is you didn't need any bio rec prerequisites. So, like, anybody could take the class. And he, he thought it was interesting because uh, he took a stem cell class with me the, the quarter before. And I was like, hey, I'm going to try this class. You should too. And he uh, started opening it up to me like, you know, I was in, in the war and I got hit with some, you know yeah. concussion and uh, I have memory issues. And, and we started talking about all that. And like, it, it's just so great to see people get like jazzed up about even the, the most cursory understanding of science. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, yeah, like I would love to keep going, but uh, I know I'm getting tired and you probably are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we're coming up on a, like an hour of conversation. Yeah. I mean, this could probably go for a couple more hours, but. I'm pretty long winded, but I, I appreciate <laughs> you giving me the chance to, to chat with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I can be too. So I understand that. Yeah. <laughs> that was fun for sure. Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to chat with you guys. I, I mean, this is, it's just fun. Like you guys, talk, uh, Casey asked me about this and I was like, Oh, you want to talk about neuroscience? It's like, you know, <laughs> it's like what I do for fun. Sure. So, <laughs> <laughs> so do, you, do you have anything you want to throw in at the last minute? Any plugs or any, anything? I, I, I guess the only plug I get is I, I would give out is that, you know, I, I, I teach at the University of Washington, Bothell, and a lot of people might not know that particular university. It's great, great classes at UW Seattle. I know a number of faculty over there. But the nice thing about Bothell is, is that the class sizes are small and, and you got some really talented teachers there and uh, you get an opportunity to interact with the faculty a little bit more. And I, I Casey and I talk quite a bit and, and we still talk, which is great, you know, and, 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 you know, that is something that, uh, that people at the Seattle campus are always willing to do, but you know, you got a class of 400 people. It's just a heck of a lot harder than if you got a class of 40 students. So it's a, it's a special place. And, uh, and if, if you like thinking about, and especially talking about things like that and you're, you know, thinking about going into a university that might be want to check out. Nice. I, absolutely. I, I will vouch for that class and for that whole campus. Like it, that was a, a really amazing, like I did both Seattle and Bothell. Bothell is hands down my favorite. And uh, I, I mean, architecture at Seattle was pretty awesome. Yeah, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, thanks for deep sink diving with us. Oh, and, sure. and uh, we'll definitely have you on again because uh, this is like an endless conversation. Oh, yeah. ne never ending fascination. So, well, yeah. thank you. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, definitely. Come back again. And we'll talk about this more. But this is good. I like it. All right. All right, cheers. All right, have a good night, everybody. Bye.